collaboration, communication, culture, and change. And then I'll say a bit about, um, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to ask me questions so that I can say something about what you want to hear. So, the mystery of diplomacy. People often, if they're asked to describe diplomacy, think of it as a rather mysterious subject. It's a subject where there is a lot of secrecy. A lot of our documents are written with secret written at the top of them. Um, we only give information to people that we think need to know about that information. People think that we do a lot of our business in quiet conversations, hidden away in private rooms. Or there's the, 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 the idea that somehow we're sort of real life James Bond characters spying on each other and running around um, with guns and driving fast cars. Then there's the question of protocol as well. Protocol is, is just a way of behaving, but it's terribly formal sometimes in, in diplomacy, knowing who goes where and who goes through a door before someone else. Then there are all the strange ceremonies we do. When I arrived in Skopje two years ago, one of the first meetings I had was with your president, Georgi Ivanov, where I had to present my credentials. Credentials are a letter from my head of state, the Queen, to your head of state, President Ivanov. And it's all done in a very formal situation where he stands there and I stand here and I have my defence attaché wearing his uniform here and he has his head of military standing there and I give a speech and he gives a speech and then we go away again and then somehow I'm the ambassador. And, um, and it's a very old-fashioned way of doing things but it's the way it's done. Then there are the ways that we speak. Very often, we were, I was introduced as His Excellency, which is a title used for ambassadors. But why, why am I more excellent than, than you or you? Really, there is nothing in that at all. It's just, a, it's just a, a traditional historical habit. I received, when I was appointed ambassador, I received a, a letter from the Queen uh, appointing me. And instead of saying, dear Mr. Garrett, or dear Charles, I would like you to be ambassador in Skopje. It talks about our most excellent, trusted, and well-beloved Charles Garrett. It's all done in very historical, traditional language, which is quite difficult to understand. Now, a lot of this is about a historical hangover. If you go back 100 years, diplomats were very typically aristocrats. They were the friends of the king or the queen or the friend of the president. And they were very high up in society. And they were, because they were friends of the head of state, they were trusted to go overseas and do their job. Today, ambassadors like me are just normal people. Ambassador, we shouldn't forget, is just another word for civil servant. And that's all I am. It's just that I am the civil servant for London, that London has chosen to send to Macedonia. But not all of it is very silly. After all, when nations speak to nations, they do sometimes need to do it in private or, or, or in secrecy. One of my jobs early in my career was on the team which negotiated the transfer of Hong Kong, which was then a British colony, to China. And we needed to have negotiations about how that happened. Now, those negotiations had to be held in secret because otherwise it would have made it a lot more difficult to do successfully. So the reality of diplomacy is a lot less exotic, a lot less mysterious than it's sometimes seen. I would say if you just look at what it is we try to do, one of them is about promoting security. So trying to get people to do things um, in a way which doesn't involve killing each other. Or to protect ourselves from threats and challenges like terrorism and migration. And how do we do this? And this is where we come to the first of those C's, collaboration. Anything which goes across borders, so from the UK to Macedonia, or from Macedonia to Greece, or from Greece to the United States, that requires some form of collaboration. And my job is really about collaboration with Macedonia. What do we do that on? There are any number of areas. To pick one, 
the awful events you'll have seen in Brussels this morning, the te terrorism, they, they, those events are unfortunately more and more common. And terrorism is one area where we try to collaborate between countries to protect ourselves against terrorism and to try and stop it happening. It can't be done on its own. It has to be done between countries. Wider questions of security. Um, Macedonia wants to join the European Union. It wants to join NATO. And one of the main reasons for this is, is of course, the country's security. And those two organisations, the EU and NATO, are two, area, two organisations that European countries and North American countries use to collaborate in the area of security. Then prosperity. Again, the, Ma the Macedonian economy cannot grow in isolation. It has to grow in collaboration with other European countries, with other world countries. The environment, again, if you poison the waters of the Vardar River, then Greece feels the, the effects of that. Or if Albanian factories poison the air and the westerly wind brings it over Macedonia, you suffer from that. So environment is another area where collaboration between countries can benefit all of us as individuals. It doesn't always work. A lot of you will know about the problems that Macedonia faces because of the, the migrants who have been coming through, some 800,000, 900,000 over the last year alone. That hasn't been the best example of collaboration, but I think that we are, through the structures of the European Union, beginning at last to bring some sort of order to that question. So this is the job of the diplomat everywhere, whether it's in London or Skopje or Hong Kong or, or New York, it's about collaboration and bringing countries together to cooperate more effectively. And a lot of this collaboration, in fact all of it I would say, is based on good communication and that's the second C, if you like. I would say that I spend 50% of my time, half of my time, talking to other ambassadors, either in Skopje or, or, or in places like Vienna or Brussels, or to Macedonian leaders, to your, your, your po political party leaders, to your ministers and, and others in, in, um, in politics, to other Macedonian stakeholders, so businessmen, to universities. I've just had a very good chat with your rector about um, this university and the academic picture. And that's how we achieve what London wants us to achieve. A second important part of communication is talking to the general public as well. Um, we have a lot of messaging on, on democracy and on human rights, on international affairs and so on. Um, and indeed on trying to attract attention to the UK, what I would call branding the UK. And that, again, is, is about trying to get people to look at Britain instead of looking at the United States or France or Italy. It's trying to attract your attention because that is good for, for, for British collaboration, it's good for British business, it's good for Britain's universities, if you think about Britain before the others. I think... There's, I, I certainly, I mean, communication is something which we all know quite a lot about, and I don't want to give you a lesson in theory of communication, but it's worth just reflecting that all of those conversations and examples of communication that I have, just as you will as well, are different from each other in important respects. So here I'm talking to you, a, a particular type of audience, about a particular subject, i.e. diplomacy. My conversation with the rector was, of course, different. And each time I have a different conversation, tomorrow when I'm back in Skopje talking to politicians, again, it'll be different. The, the message will be different, the way the audience will be different, the way I put it across will also be different. And I'd like to move on in a minute to the question of how the Foreign Office has changed over the time I've been working on it. That'll be the fourth C. And there's one area where communication has changed in particular. And I'd like just to do a little exercise with you. When I, was, when I joined the Foreign Office in 1987, 
most people got most of their information from TV, radio, or just about everyone from the newspapers as well. When I walked to the station to go into work in the morning, everyone, absolutely everyone, would be buying a newspaper, sometimes two newspapers, to get their, inform their daily information and read it. And in those days, a diplomat would spend a lot of time working with newspapers to place articles or to influence articles or somehow to get communication out. How many people in this room, I'd like you to stick up your hand, how many people here buy a newspaper every day? Right, you either didn't understand me or you don't buy newspapers. Okay, how, how many people in this room use Instagram? Okay, keep your hand up. How many people here use Facebook? How many people here use Twitter? We, we've covered the whole room just with those three examples. Then, of course, there are others like WhatsApp and Snapchat and so on. That is how people today communicate. And that is something which I have had to learn. Fortunately, I've got children who can teach me, and I've got a very good communications team in the embassy who can help me. But we now need, instead of just going to newspapers, to use Twitter, to use Facebook, to use Instagram and Snapchat and all the others to get our messages out. That is a key difference between 1987 when I joined and 2016 here in Macedonia. Now the third C, that's culture. How do we, I see culture as how do we do things around here? So. The way you do things is your culture. The way I do things and the way other British people do things back in the UK is their culture. I've never seen any particular culture as either good or bad. They're just different. And they are all different. And this is something which diplomats really have to try to understand if they're going to be able to collaborate successfully and if they're going to be able to communicate successfully. Now, culture and understanding culture is not about stereotypes. Stereotypes are often based on cultural differences. So you might have seen that rather jokey poster on, which you can get if you search on cultural stereotypes in Europe, where you have the perfect European would be um, someone who knows how to cook like the French, someone who knows how to build cars like the Germans, someone who um, is like an Italian in their love life someone who's like, you know, the British this, whatever. The mix of those stereotypes. They are based on cultural differences, but they are just stereotypes. And they're almost always misleading. They become a kind of false comfort. So part of the diplomat's job is to really get beyond that stereotype or underneath that stereotype and understand what the Macedonian person is really like. Because only then can we, un we anticipate decisions that are made here. Only then can we understand your position, your political position, and provide good advice back to London. But it's much more complicated than that. Because if you take a, com a, a country like the UK, when I grew up in the UK, everyone I knew was white and came from an Anglo-Saxon background. If you go to London today, a city of 8 million people, there are 330 different mother tongues spoken in London schools. That's 330 different cultures. And if you're a Macedonian diplomat working in London, it's not good enough to understand the Anglo-Saxon culture. You have to try and understand the London culture, which is influenced by the 330 other different cultures that are there. These are, of course, African ones. There are Nigerians, Ghanaians, um, Sierra Leoneans, South Africans, Malawians. There are Asian ones, Chinese. 20 different types of Chinese language spoken in London. Japanese, Thai, and I mean, all the rest of it, all coming together in a kind of complex but brilliant cultural mix. And that's not just diplomats who have to understand it. It's teachers as well. It's politicians, it's public servants. So for example, London is now the third or fourth largest French city in the world. And when the French have their presidential elections next year, the candidates won't just go to Paris or Marseille 
or Bordeaux or Lyon to do their campaigning. They will also go to London to campaign there. Take Sao Paulo in Brazil, Brazilian city, right? Well, it's not just a Brazilian city because there are over one million Japanese people living there, over one million. And the same is true, not just in Britain and Brazil, but in France and Germany and, and Belgium. Almost anywhere you look today, you have this kind of cultural mix. Someone once asked me what my top tips were for engaging successfully with different cultures. Everyone will have their own favourite approaches to this. Here are six ideas from me. One, always be open and curious. Ask questions. Don't assume you know about people. That's how you'll learn about them. Don't fall for the stereotypes. I've spoken about that. You really have to understand the cultures and get underneath them. Understand that you will never change a culture, ever. You might not like the culture, you might find it difficult to deal with, but you will never be able to change it. You have to understand how to work with it. Be honest and transparent. Never try to hide things. Always be open about things. Don't overlook the small things. One of the things I learned very early in my time in Hong Kong was how seriously Chinese people take social details, very small social details, like giving you a business card. In the West, we just take a business card out and we hand it over like this. Or sometimes even we make a sort of slightly masculine attempt to look like a cowboy and fling it across the table. In China, that is the height of rudeness. In China, you have to take both hands and hand the card over. Um, and when you receive a card, you have to take it with both hands. If you don't do that, you start on the wrong step. And remember that there are some universal values. However much cultures differ, people will always respond to kindness. And people will always respond, in a different way, to temper. If you lose your temper, you lose the argument. So that brings me to my last C. How has the FCO, how has the Foreign Office, the world of diplomacy, changed in the time that I've been there? I've been there now almost 30 years, 29 years this year. That's almost a generation. And it has changed um, in some ways, not at all, but in other ways, completely and utterly. I would pick out four things where we've, we've changed. One, the type of employee. When I went to the Foreign Office, just about everyone was male, just about everyone was white. Today, we're a much more diverse group of people. There are many more women working in the Foreign Office. About 30% of our ambassadors worldwide are women. And our ethnic mix is much more representative of the British ethnic mix as well. There are people of an Indian background in the Foreign Office, there are people of African backgrounds, East Asian backgrounds. Any, any way that the British society um, is mixed is now reflected in the Foreign Office. So that's one area. Second area is that there's more movement in and out of the Foreign Office. I went off, as I mentioned, to, to, to the London 2012 Organising Committee, in part because I was excited and motivated about working on the Olympics but also in part because I knew that if I spent three years outside the Foreign Office, I would learn new things and different things than I would learn in the Foreign Office, that I would become stronger and better at my job. And we do a lot more of that now, which, which is great for the Foreign Office because it gives us new ideas, new ways of thinking. It means that we can strengthen our management and make the organisation a stronger place. The third area is that we're much, much more focused now on objectives. In the old days, we used to think we're here because we're here, because we're here, well, because we're here. And we didn't really think about why we were here. We just thought that we were there to do foreign policy stuff. We're now very focused on saying, why do we want to be active in Russia? What, what can we actually achieve for the UK there. Why do we want to be active in Macedonia? 
what can we actually achieve for the UK there? And that's a great way of doing things for two reasons. One, you can use your money more effectively. And two, it's much more motivating because you know you're making a difference. The fourth thing, the last thing, is that we're better at communication than we used to be. Um, I don't think that um, it's uh, a, a, a secret that sometimes civil servants are the most boring people to listen to, and we're all guilty of that occasionally. But I think now, partly because we're focused on our objectives, we find it easier to communicate more effectively. Now, where have we not changed? I would say one area where we haven't changed, and it's a really important area of this, is in the principles of what it takes to make a good civil servant. And central to that is that we regard ourselves in the UK as servants of the political master. So whoever's in government, we serve them. I myself, of course, have political opinions. I vote in elections in the UK. I vote in referendums in the UK. I don't tell anyone about how I voted, except possibly my wife, possibly my children. But it doesn't matter about work, because I leave those political opinions at work, and I come in and I will serve whoever happens to be my political master of the day, whether that's from a Labour Party, or from the Conservative Party, or from a coalition. And I've served all of those different times. That we regard as a very important principle in the British Civil Service, and that hasn't changed. I also think it probably won't change, because it works very well for us. So that's, um, that's kind of everything I've got to say, the sort of the four C's. I hope I've been able to explain a little bit about my perspective on diplomacy. But let's use that as a, a sort of a basis, a foundation for having a conversation. I'm very happy to take questions. One in the front row. my own personal experience after my visit to the UK, which left me with the impression uh, that there is a large number of foreign citizens in the UK, more specifically from the Asian community. Uh, from my observation, uh, observations of the society in the UK, I was left wondering, uh, uh, what is the attitude of the UK with the foreign colonial countries, considering that some Asian countries such as India and surrounding countries are examples of ex-colonial countries? And I would like uh, to know as well, if the UK were to exit the uh, European Union, I would like to know uh, if this will result in a change in the external policy of the UK and recovery to the British imperialism. I'm sure many others have the same questions, so please, are you able to answer these questions for me? Great questions. Really good questions. And fantastic English, by the way. Um, yes, you're, you're, you're right about... The, the new diversity of the British population. Um, it really started after the Second World War, when we started moving from being an imperial power to being a modern European state without colonies. And during that process, a lot of people started coming from the, the old colonies, so from Jamaica, from India, from Nigeria, from Hong Kong, from, from all around the old British Empire. And they started, first of all, settling in towns like London, Liverpool, Manchester, and so on. And the, the nature of society changed in those cities first. Um, it's brought an enormous richness to, to the UK. So, for example, just to take one daily example, in terms of the food you can buy, it's no longer just fish and chips or roast beef. It's fish and chips or roast beef plus Indian curries, plus Chinese food, plus Thai food, plus African food. Any high street in the UK now has 20 different types of food available. That kind of cultural change, that kind of cultural choice is now common, not just in the big cities, but throughout all of the UK, in the, in the, in the small provincial towns as well. But more seriously, it impacts on the way that you can do business as a society. Um, one of the reasons why London has such a successful economy is because it has access to completely different perspectives on a problem. If you put together a team to, to solve a problem 
And on that team, you have just one type of person, all British white males. You will get one sort of answer. If you put together a team which has a British person, an Asian person, an African person, an American person, you will get much more creativity and you're much more likely to get stronger solutions to the problem. So that diversity, all those new people, have really strengthened the British economy. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And the first part of your question about the Commonwealth, it's a kind of historical advantage that we have in the UK. We were lucky, I think, in the way that we moved out of the imperial period because we did it in a way that we were able to stay friends with countries like India and with the African countries that were our colonies and with Hong Kong and so on. And staying friends is important because we can build business links much more easily. India, as you know, is, its economy is just growing like crazy at the moment. If we can attract investment from, those, from that growing economy into the UK, we're stronger for it. If we can build business links between Indians in Leicester or London or Liverpool and Indians in Delhi or, or Bangladesh or De Delhi or, or Bangalore, then we are a much stronger, in a much stronger position to, 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 to get some sort of benefit out of that economic growth. <coughs> Britain leaving the EU is a different question. I, I, I think, I mean, we have a referendum coming up. Um, it will go one way or the other. It's not going to be the end of the world either way. Um, and while the relationship between the UK and Europe will change dramatically one way or the other, um, opportunities will still exist for, 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 Britain's, for, for, for Britain's businesses, for British people and so on. One thing that won't happen, I think, is that we will reorientate back towards the Commonwealth. The modern world is, is, is globally interlinked. You know, we need to do business not just with India and, and, and Nigeria and other British colonies. We need to do business with Germany and France and Macedonia, as well as China and Russia. You, you cannot exclude anyone in today's world. <coughs> Are all the questions going to come from this row? <laughs> uh, Ambassador, I would like to ask you uh, two questions about Brexit. So the first is, what is the main reason for Great Britain to, uh, to look about the Brexit possibility? And second, what are the main pros and cons for Great Britain if it leaves you? Thank you. The question of whether the U UK should be part of Europe is one that has always been examined in the UK since, since before we joined, <coughs> just as it is in in France or Italy or, or Poland. Um, the, and there's never been a clear answer to it. There's never been 100% support for it or 100% opposition to it. So it's been part of that public debate for years and years. Um, and I think that it's, it, it's natural in a way that, um, that, that that should be part of the ongoing political debate. Now, Europe itself has faced a very difficult period over the last eight years, I would say, since the financial crisis of 2008 um, and the problems in Greece um, and exacerbated by problems with the migrants and my, migrant problem as well. There have been a number of people asking themselves whether the European Union is designed in the right way to support the whole community of nations and each individual nation within it. Um, and people, people will always come up with different answers to that question. But one thing is true, the European Union can always be reformed. You know, no organisation is ever perfect. The environment it operates in is changing, and so we have to examine the, um, the, the ways that we can, we, we can try and change it. Um, in terms of pros and cons, I think that the... Um, I mean, there, there are massive advantages to being in the European Union. As I was talking about collaboration, you know, the European Union is designed as a vehicle for collaborating. So it's how we can collaborate best with France and Italy and Spain. It's, it, it, and it's why we want Macedonia to join the European Union. 
because then we can collaborate more effectively with you. We can build all those alliances about combating organised crime, about protecting the environment, about generating prosperity and wealth. We can do it much more effectively if we're both members of the European Union. So I would say that is the greatest advantage, the greatest pro to being in the European Union. What are the cons? Well, one of the questions that people talk about a lot is, is the question of sovereignty. And you hear this a lot in the British debate about how being a member of the European Union means that Britain loses part of its sovereignty. Well, that is true, but that is in the nature of the club. You share your sovereignty with other nations so that you make yourself overall stronger. You might get slightly less control over decisions that affect you, but you get a better decision in the end and you get greater strength. So possibly there's a con in losing some of the, the sovereignty, but there is also a pro in what it actually gives you in return. Okay, I'm going to take a question from you, and then we're moving on. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Is uh, there a possibility that one of the additional, uh, additional uh, reasons for Great Britain to leave the European Union is the European Commission's plans uh, regarding the, uh, the refugees quotes every EU member will be obligated to accept? Is Great Britain trying to avoid that obligation? No, Britain is not trying to avoid its obligations over, over the refugee crisis. Um, Britain, Britain's strategic approach on the migrant crisis has always been that you can't solve it simply by supporting the migrants when they arrive in, in your country or in Europe. You have to address the root causes. So you have to stop the war in Syria. You have to neutralize ISIS, you have to rebuild Syria and then find ways of supporting those migrants in the place where they actually want to be rather than trying to make their life better over here. That's the strategic approach. So we've, I mean, we've, we've spent more money than any country except the US in Syria and Jordan and Turkey and Lebanon to support the migrants where they are there because that is, that is the best place for them to be. At some stage in the future, Syria will need to rebuild, and it's going to, in order to rebuild, it's going to need it's the, the doctors and the dentists and the teachers and the engineers and the builders and everyone who have gone to Germany and Sweden and, and other parts of Europe. Um, it's going to need them back in Syria. So we believe that rather than support people setting up new lives in other parts of Europe, we should support them where they can most effectively and most quickly get back into Syria to help the rebuilding when that happens, hopefully soon. Okay, let's have a question. There's a lady here. My my view on visa liberation is that it is a good thing. Um, I think it's it's fantastic for Macedonian passport holders that you have visa free access to the Schengen countries. Um, really important for you for, for for recreation, for social reasons, for work reasons, and and I would very very much like to extend that to the United Kingdom as well. Um, I believe that it is one of the, the biggest single obstacles to increased collaboration and communication between the British people and the Macedonian people, and therefore to, 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 to business links as well. But it's not my choice. I, I, I can't make that. The, the policy decision is made by another part of, of the British government in London, and, um, and, and they base their decisions on a whole range of different factors. I would hope that it can be changed soon, in the near future, um, but I can't guarantee that. All I can say is that if we can get Macedonia into the European Union, it then becomes unnecessary because you would no longer need a visa to visit the UK and you would have access to the whole of the single market. Other questions? Should the European policy towards migration change because uh, of the refugee crisis and because of migrants? 
economic crisis because of coming not just from the Middle East but from Africa as well. Like Mauritania, Somalia, and other countries. I think that the short answer to your question is that yes, it should change. It, it, it should change the whole time because it needs to be reactive to an environment which itself is changing very fast. But I think there are certain principles which should not change. And one of those is around how you support a refugee, how you support someone who is leaving their home because their, their, their lives are under threat or their families are under threat, or because they're being persecuted in some way. All countries, whether it's the UK or Macedonia, have a responsibility, um, an international responsibility, to support people in that situation and to give them asylum if necessary. So that's a principle which is absolutely firm and, and, and should not change. Um, on the other hand, and this is, this is where it becomes more complex, and you mentioned a number of people coming out of countries in Africa, for example, who are not, um, who are not perhaps fleeing uh, war or terror or persecution, who are perhaps just coming to Europe because they see an opportunity to, to have a, a richer life, to make more money, and perhaps to support their families better at home. There's, there's, a, there's a big difference between those two categories. And, um, and it's, I think, one that, that European countries need to get a grip on and to understand better and to find stronger policies on. Because one of the challenges we faced in responding to the migrant crisis has been that politicians have found it difficult to match what they know is the, the correct humanitarian response and the response they need for electoral reasons, i.e. popularity reasons. The two things are somewhere apart. And one of the reasons for that is that a lot of European Union um, voters are scared about the number of people who are coming in. They want to support the real refugees, but they don't necessarily feel comfortable with all of these economic migrants coming too. So I think we have to find a way of, of, of understanding the problem, of, of find a way of supporting um, people where they need to be. I mean, economic migrants in, who, who come out of Africa or Asia or, or, or anywhere else, the real answer to that problem is, is, is in trade and, 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 and international law and making it easier for those countries' economies to develop and, and provide opportunities for those people to stay at home where they are and where they would actually rather be than going to a country like Germany or Britain in order to find a better life. More questions? Right at the front here. I, I would like to think that the European Union would be a stronger place after the refugee crisis. And the reason for that is that it's partly to do with the diversity of our societies. I mean, if we have, if we have new people coming into our societies, they will get stronger. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it causes challenges in the short term, but in the medium and long term, they become a stronger society. Um, so there's that but also the links to the other countries. If, for example, a, 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 a Syrian doctor leaves Damascus because it's a dangerous place to be and spends two or three years in Germany and then goes back to Damascus after the peace has come back, then there is a link between Germany and Syria, which is a very useful um, additional link for, for, for Germany. A small piece, perhaps, but millions of those links provide for a much, a much better network for, for European Union member states. Um, so I, I, think, I, I think there are ways that we can strengthen the European Union after the migrants crisis. Um, I would also like to think that it, it has made European Union countries think about the nature of their responsibility over, over asylum um, and what we need to do to support these people. And I'd also like to think that it will make people think, governments think, about what responsibilities we have to other countries near us, like Syria in, 
this case, or Iraq, and ways that we can support them and stop these conflicts becoming major wars which cause millions of people to, to have to lose their homes. It, it's a great question because I think it's one of the most important areas of collaboration between countries. It's at that level of universities because that, that is, has such a powerful impact on, on collaboration between societies and such a powerful impact on, on business. It's collab collaboration like that can, can be really very powerful in a business sense. Um, the, our embassy does not actually have responsibility for that particular area of the relationship between Macedonia and Britain. That's um, looked after mostly by the British Council, also based in Skopje. And they do a lot of work, mostly with um, educational institutions here in, in, in Macedonia to, um, to share the benefit of our experience and, and understanding. Um, but we also have some very powerful um, programs like the Chivnik Scholarship Program, for example, which is a, a scheme under which Macedonian students can go to British universities for postgraduate study on a scholarship, a very good scholarship which pays for the tuition fees and pays for the accommodation and pays for the travel, um, which so far has, and I can't remember the exact figure, I think it's something like 150 Macedonians have been through the Chivnik program. And these are all people who are, of course, great ambassadors for that relationship between our two countries. So I would see that as a very powerful example of it. And, and, and I would encourage anyone here who's at all interested in postgraduate study in the UK to consider the Chivnik scheme, because it really is, I think, one of the best clubs in Macedonia. But there are, of course, also the, 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 the autonomous links between universities. And I know that this university has, um, ha, has, a, has a good relationship with the Royal Holloway College in London, also with the University of Edinburgh. And, and you know, anything that we can do to support that in terms of, of, of helping generate and build relationships, we, we would very, very gladly talk to you about. More questions. More questions. I've obviously squeezed you dry of questions. Is there no more, no more curiosity about it? There's one in the back there. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, since UK is, is considering to get out from U, uh, EU, uh, why should Macedonia consider to get in? And do you think that if uh, UK get out of Europe, uh, would it be a domino effect? And uh, can the European Union just collapse? Um, it's exactly the right question to ask. Um, I have spent my two years in Macedonia um, trying to support Macedonia to get into the European Union. Um, and, um, and now it looks like a lot of British people want to get out. I believe, and the British government believes, that the right place for the UK is inside the European Union, but in a reformed European Union. That the European Union has to change, just as all organisations need to change. And, um, and I think that it needs to go through a period of really examining how it can best support its own member states, and then reform itself in order to provide that. And if that's the right place for the UK to be, it's also absolutely the right place for Macedonia to be. Because you need collaboration, you need friends, you need these international structures which make you stronger. That's, that's why Macedonia 
should join, and it's why the United Kingdom should stay within it. If, on the other hand, the referendum means that the UK gets out, will there be a domino effect? I, I don't think so. I, I think the European Union is much stronger than that. I think that the, 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 the fundamental reasons for those countries to stay together are really very strong. And I don't believe that you know, if, you know, having, seen the Brit having seen the British leave, the Poles would suddenly say, yes, we want to get out as well, or the Spanish would say, we want to get out, because their national interests are all within the European Union as well. So I, I don't think there would be. That's not to say it's an easy situation. I think the European Union is going through a difficult period. There are lots of external pressures, um, economic pressures, social pressures, military pressures, and it needs to face up to those. But it, it will come through this period and be an even stronger organisation. <laughs> okay, um, on the first question, why is Saudi Arabia and other regional countries not taking migrants or not doing more to support them? You, you'd have to ask them for an answer to that. I, I, I think absolutely um, there needs to be a regional response which, um, which, which is stronger and which is, is more targeted at resolving the problems in Syria and supporting the migrants. I, I think it's, it's a good question to ask, but it's not for me to, to answer that. All I can do is say that Britain will, like other European states, including Macedonia, play its part to, um, to, to handle the migrant crisis. <coughs> UK Argentina, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question, that. I think that um, in some ways it's a very historical question because it, it feels like a question left over from 50 or 60 years ago. And in a way it is. The Falkland Islands are far too small to, um, to be an independent country, but for historical reasons, the sovereignty rests with London and the people in them, there are about 2, 000, 2, 2 to 2,500 people living in the Falkland Islands, want to be under British sovereignty. They don't want to be under, uh, under Argentine sovereignty. So that's just, you know, the situation. And we, all of us, whether it's British or Argentinian, should handle that situation as it presents itself and, and, those the, and, and deal with the facts. Unfortunately, sometimes leaders in, in Buenos Aires take the Falkland Islands as an opportunity to, 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 to not, not so much to cause trouble for the United Kingdom, but to generate a kind of atmosphere which, which is good for them in, electoral, um, in, in an electoral sense at home in Argentina. That's when it gets diff di uh, difficult. And the last government was doing quite a lot of that, using the Falklands as a way of generating support within Argentina. Um, I think that we should all de-escalate that and take the conflict out of it, take the tension out of it, because at the end of the day, we're talking about 2,500 people who just want to get on with their lives in, um, in a remote bit of the world. Any more questions? How are we doing for time? We're okay. Okay. There is, there is time for another question if anyone would like to ask one. Otherwise... Great. Well, th thank you all very much indeed. Um, for listening so politely, for asking such great questions, and above all, for listening and asking those questions in English, um, which makes me feel slightly ashamed that I don't have the Macedonian to do it. But, um, but thank you all very much. It's been a great pleasure to meet you this afternoon, and I hope to see you again at some stage. And just as a last thought, if ever you have any questions, this isn't the end of the question and answer session. If you have any questions about the UK, then don't hesitate to contact the British Embassy and, and ask us those questions and we'll try and answer them.